Section 6 of The Two Paths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Todd Albrick. The Two Paths by John Ruskin. Section 6, Lecture 3. Modern Manufacture and Design. Part 1. A lecture delivered at Bradford, March 1859. It is with a deep sense of necessity for your indulgence that I venture to address you tonight, or that I venture at any time to address the pupils of schools of design intended for the advancement of taste in special branches of manufacture. No person is able to give useful and definite help toward such special applications of art unless he is entirely familiar with the conditions of labor and natures of material involved in the work. And indefinite help is little better than no help at all, Nay, the few remarks which I propose to lay before you this evening will, I fear, be rather suggestive of difficulties than helpful in conquering them. Nevertheless, it may not be altogether unserviceable to define clearly for you, and this at least I am able to do, one or two of the more stern general obstacles which stand at present in the way of our success in design, and to warn you against exertion of effort in any vain or wasteful way, till these main obstacles are removed. The first of these is our not understanding the scope and dignity of decorative design. With all our talk about it, the very meaning of the words decorative art remains confused and undecided. I want, if possible, to settle this question for you tonight, and to show you that the principles on which you must work are likely to be false, in proportion as they are narrow, true, only as they are founded on a perception of the connection of all branches of art with each other. Observe then first, the only essential distinction between decorative and other art is the being fitted for a fixed place, and in that place related either in subordination or command to the effect of other pieces of art. And all the greatest art which the world has produced is thus fitted for a place and subordinated to a purpose, there is no existing highest order art but is decorative. The best sculpture yet produced has been the decoration of a temple front, the best painting the decoration of a room. Raphael's best doing is merely the wall colouring of a suite of apartments in the Vatican, and his cartoons were made for tapestries. Correggio's best doing is the decoration of two small church cupolas at Parma. Michelangelo's of a ceiling in the Pope's private chapel, Tintoret's of a ceiling and side wall belonging to a charitable society at Venice, while Titian and Veronese threw out their noblest thoughts, not even on the inside but on the outside of the common brick and plaster walls of Venice. Get rid, then, at once of any idea of decorative art being a degraded or a separate kind of art. Its nature or essence is simply its being fitted for a definite place, and, in that place, forming part of a great and harmonious whole, in companionship with other art, and so far from this being a degradation to it, so far from decorative art being inferior to other art because it is fixed to a spot, on the whole, it may be considered as rather a piece of degradation that it should be portable. Portable art, independent of all place, is for the most part ignoble art. Your little Dutch landscape which you put over your sideboard today and between the windows tomorrow is a far more contemptible piece of work than the extents of field and forest with which Benotho has made green and beautiful the once melancholy arcade of the Campo Santo at Pisa. And the wild boar of silver which you use for a seal or lock into a velvet case is little likely to be so noble a beast as the bronze boar who foams from the fountain from under his tusks in the marketplace of Florence. It is indeed possible that the portable picture or image may be first-rate of its kind, but it is not first-rate because it is portable, nor are Titian's frescoes less than first-rate because they are fixed. Nay, very frequently the highest compliment you can pay to a cabinet picture is to say, it is as grand as a fresco. Keeping, then, this fact fixed in our minds, that all art may be decorative, and that the greatest art yet produced has been decorative, 
we may proceed to distinguish the orders and dignities of decorative art. Thus, 1. The first order of it is that which is meant for places where it cannot be disturbed or injured, and where it can be perfectly seen, and then the main parts of it should be, and have always been made, by the great masters as perfect and as full of nature as possible. You will every day hear it absurdly said that room decoration should be by flat patterns, by dead colours, by conventional monotonies, and I know not what. Now, just be assured of this, nobody ever yet used conventional art to decorate with when he could do anything better, and knew that what he did would be safe. Nay, a great painter will always give you the natural art, safe or not. Correggio gets a commission to paint a room on the ground floor of a palace at Parma. Any of our people, bred on our fine modern principles, would have covered it with a diaper, or with stripes or flourishes, or mosaic patterns. Not so Correggio. He paints a thick trellis of vine leaves with oval openings, and lovely children leaping through them into the room. And lovely children, depend on it, are rather more desirable decorations than diaper, if you can do them, but they are not quite so easily done. In like manner, Tintoret has to paint the whole end of the council hall at Venice. An orthodox decorator would have set himself to make the wall look like a wall. Tintoret thinks it would be rather better if he can manage it to make it look a little like paradise, stretches his canvas right over the wall, and his clouds right over his canvas, brings the light through his clouds all blue and clear, zodiac beyond zodiac, rolls away the vaporous flood from under the feet of saints, leaving them at last in infinitudes of light, unorthodox in the last degree, but on the whole pleasant. And so in all other cases whatever, the greatest decorative art is wholly unconventional, downright, pure, good painting and sculpture, but always fitted for its place, and subordinated to the purpose it has to serve in that place. 2. But if art is to be placed where it is liable to injury, to wear and tear, or to alteration of its form, as for instance on domestic utensils, and armour, and weapons, and dress, in which either the ornament will be worn out by the usage of the thing, or it will be cast into altered shape by the play of its folds, then it is wrong to put beautiful and perfect art to such uses, and you want forms of inferior art, such as will be, by their simplicity, less liable to injury, or by reason of their complexity and continuousness, may show to advantage, however distorted by the folds they are cast into. And thus arise the various forms of inferior decorative art, respecting which the general law is that the lower the place and office of the thing, the less of natural or perfect form you should have in it. A zigzag or a checker is thus a better, because a more consistent ornament for a cup or platter than a landscape or portrait is. Hence the general definition of the true forms of conventional ornament is that they consist in the bestowal of as much beauty on the object as shall be consistent with its material, its place, and its office. Let us consider these three modes of consistency a little. A conventionalism by cause of inefficiency of material if for instance we are required to represent a human figure with stone only we cannot represent its color we reduce its color to whiteness that is not elevating the human body but degrading it only it would be a much greater degradation to give its color falsely diminish beauty as much as you will but do not misrepresent it so again when we are sculpturing a face we can't carve its eyelashes. The face is none the better for wanting its eyelashes. It is injured by the want, but would be much more injured by a clumsy representation of them. Neither can we carve the hair. We must be content with the conventionalism of vile, solid knots and lumps of marble, instead of the golden cloud that encompasses the fair human face with its waving mystery. The lumps of marble are not an elevated representation of hair, they are a degraded one, yet better than any attempt to imitate hair with the incapable material. In all cases in which such imitation is attempted, instant degradation to a still lower level is the result. For the effort to imitate shows that the workman has only a base and poor conception of the beauty of the reality, 
else he would know his task to be hopeless, and give it up at once, so that all endeavours to avoid conventionalism, when the material demands it, result from insensibility to truth, and are among the worst forms of vulgarity. Hence, in the greatest Greek statues, the hair is very slightly indicated, not because the sculptor disdained hair, but because he knew what it was too well to touch it insolently. I do not doubt but that the Greek painters drew hair exactly as Titian does. Modern attempts to produce finished pictures on glass result from the same base vulgarism. No man who knows what painting means can endure a painted glass window which emulates painter's work. But he rejoices in a glowing mosaic of broken colour, for that is what the glass has the special gift and right of producing. Footnote. See Appendix 2, Sir Joshua Reynolds' Disappointment. End footnote. B. Conventionalism by cause of inferiority of place. When work is to be seen at a great distance, or in dark places, or in some other imperfect way, it constantly becomes necessary to treat it coarsely or severely, in order to make it effective. The statues on cathedral fronts, in good times of design, are variously treated according to their distances. No fine execution is put into the features of the Madonna, who rules the group of figures above the south transept of Rouen at 150 feet above the ground. But in base modern work, as Milan Cathedral, the sculpture is finished without any reference to distance, and the merit of every statue is supposed to consist in the visitor's being obliged to ascend three hundred steps before he can see it. C. Conventionalism by cause of inferiority of office. When one piece of ornament is to be subordinated to another, as the moulding is to the sculpture it encloses, or the fringe of a drapery to the statue it veils, this inferior ornament needs to be degraded in order to mark its lower office. And this is best done by refusing, more or less, the introduction of natural form. The less of nature it contains, the more degraded is the ornament, and the fitter for a humble place. But, however far a great workman may go in refusing the higher organisms of nature, he always takes care to retain the magnificence of natural lines. That is to say, of the infinite curves, such as I have analyzed in the fourth volume of Modern Painters. His copyist, fancying that they can follow him without nature, miss precisely the essence of all the work, so that even the simplest piece of Greek conventional ornament loses the whole of its value in any modern imitation of it, the finer curves being always missed. Perhaps one of the dullest and least justifiable mistakes which have yet been made about my writing is the supposition that I have attacked or despised Greek work, I have attacked Palladian work, and modern imitation of Greek work. Of Greek work itself I have never spoken but with a reverence quite infinite. I name Phidias always in exactly the same tone with which I speak of Michelangelo, Titian, and Dante. My first statement of this faith, now thirteen years ago, was surely clear enough. We shall see by this light three colossal images standing up side by side, looming in their great rest of spirituality above the whole world horizon, Phidias, Michelangelo, and Dante. From these we may go down step by step among the mighty men of every age, securely and certainly observant of diminished lustre in every appearance of restlessness and effort, until the last trace of inspiration vanishes in the tottering affectation or tortured insanities of modern times. Modern Painters, Volume 2, page 253. This was surely plain speaking enough, and from that day to this my effort has been, not less continually, to make the heart of Greek work known than the heart of Gothic, namely, the nobleness of conception of form derived from perpetual study of the figure. And my complaint of the modern architect has been not that he followed the Greeks, but that he denied the first laws of life in theirs, as in all other art. The fact is that all good subordinate forms of ornamentation ever yet existent in the world have been invented, and others as beautiful can only be invented 
by men primarily exercised in drawing or carving the human figure. I will not repeat here what I have already twice insisted upon to the students of London and Manchester respecting the degradation of temper and intellect which follows the pursuit of art without reference to natural form, as among the Asiatics. Here I will only trespass upon your patience so far as to mark the inseparable connection between figure drawing and good ornamental work, in the great European schools and all that are connected with them. Tell me, then, first of all, what ornamental work is usually put before our students as the type of decorative perfection? Raphael's arabesques, are they not? Well, Raphael knew a little about the figure, I suppose, before he drew them. I do not say that I like those arabesques, but there are certain qualities in them which are inimitable by modern designers, and those qualities are just the fruit of the master's figure study. What is given the student as next to Raphael's work? Cinquecento ornament generally. Well, Cinquecento generally, with its birds and cherubs and wreath, foliage and clustered fruit, was the amusement of men who habitually and easily carved the figure or painted it. All the truly fine specimens of it have figures or animals as main parts of the design. Nay, but, some anciently or medievally minded person will exclaim, we don't want to study Cinquecento. We want severer, purer conventionalism. What will you have, Egyptian ornament? Why, the whole mass of it is made up of multitudinous human figures in every kind of action, and magnificent action. Their kings drawing their bows in their chariots, their sheaves of arrows rattling at their shoulders, the slain falling under them as before a pestilence, their captors driven before them in astonished troops. And do you expect to imitate Egyptian ornament without knowing how to draw the human figure? Nay, but you will take Christian ornament, purest medieval christian thirteenth century yes and do you suppose you will find the christian less human the least natural and most purely conventional ornament of the gothic schools is that of their painted glass and do you suppose painted glass in the fine times was ever wrought without figures we have got into the way among our other modern wretchednesses of trying to make windows of leaf diapers and of strips of twisted red and yellow bands, looking like the patterns of currant jelly on the top of Christmas cakes. But every casement of old glass contained a saint's history. The windows of Bourges, Chartres, or Rouen have ten, fifteen, or twenty medallions in each, and each medallion contains two figures, at least, often six or seven, representing every event of interest in the history of the saint, whose life is in question. Nay, but, you say, those figures are rude and quaint, and ought not to be imitated. Why, so is the leafage, rude and quaint, yet you imitate that. The coloured border pattern of geranium or ivy leaf is not one whit better drawn, or more like geraniums and ivy, than the figures are like figures. But you call the geranium leaf idealised. Why don't you call the figures so? The fact is, neither are idealised but both are conventionalized on the same principles and in the same way. And if you want to learn how to treat the leafage, the only way is to learn first how to treat the figure. And you may soon test your powers in this respect. Those old workmen were not afraid of the most familiar subjects. The windows of Chartres were presented by the trades of the town, and at the bottom of each window is a representation of the proceedings of the tradesmen in the business which enabled them to pay for the window. There are smiths at the forge, couriers at their hides, tanners looking into their pits, mercers selling goods over the counter, all made into beautiful medallions. Therefore, whenever you want to know whether you have got any real power of composition or adaptation in ornament, don't be content with sticking leaves together by the ends. Anybody can do that. But try to conventionalize a butcher's or a greengrocer's with Saturday night customers buying cabbage and beef. That will tell you if you can design or not. I can fancy you're losing patience with me altogether just now. We asked this fellow down to tell our workmen how to make shawls, and he is only trying to teach them how to caricature. But have a little patience with me, and examine after I have done a little for yourselves into the history of ornamental art, and you will discover why I do this. I repeat, 
that all great ornamental art whatever is founded on the effort of the workman to draw the figure and in the best schools to draw all that he saw about him in living nature the best art of pottery is acknowledged to be that of greece and all the power of design exhibited in it down to the merest zigzag arises primarily from the workman having been forced to outline nymphs and knights from those helmed and draped figures he holds his power of egyptian ornament i have just spoken you have everything given there that the workman saw people of his nation employed in hunting fighting fishing visiting making love building cooking everything they did is drawn magnificently or familiarly as was needed in byzantine ornament saints or animals which are types of various spiritual power are the main subjects and from the church down to the piece of enameled metal figure 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 always principle in norman and gothic work you have with all their quiet saints also other much disquieted persons hunting feasting fighting and so on or whole hordes of animals racing after each other in the bio tapestry queen matilda gave as well as she could in many respects graphically enough the whole history of the conquest of england events as you increase in power of art you have more and more finished figures up to the solemn sculptures of wells cathedral or the cherubic enrichments of the venetian madonna dei miracoli therefore i will tell you fearlessly for i know it is true you must raise your workmen up to life or you will never get from him one line of well-imagined conventionalism we have at present no good ornamental design we can't have it yet and we must be patient if we want to have it do not hope to feel the effect of your schools at once but raise the men as high as you can and then let them stoop as low as you need no great man ever minds stooping encourage the students in sketching accurately and continually from nature anything that comes in their way still life flowers animals but above all figures and so far as you allow of any difference between an artist's training and theirs let it be not in what they draw but in the degree of conventionalism you require in the sketch for my own part i should always endeavor to give thorough artistical training first but i am not certain the experiment being yet untried what results may be obtained by a truly intelligent practice of conventional drawing such as that of the egyptians greeks or thirteenth century french which consists in the utmost possible rendering of natural form by the fewest possible lines the animal and bird drawing of the egyptians is in their fine age quite magnificent under its conditions magnificent in two ways first in keenest perception of the main forms and facts in the creature and secondly in the grandeur of line by which their forms are abstracted and insisted on making every asp ibis and vulture a sublime spectre of asp or ibis or vulture power the way for students to get some of this gift again some only for i believe the fullness of the gift itself to be connected with vital superstition and with resulting intensity of reverence people were likely to know something about hawks and ibises when to kill one was to be irrevocably judged to death is never to pass a day without drawing some animal from the life allowing themselves the fewest possible lines and colours to do it with but resolving that whatever is characteristic of the animal shall in some way or other be shown footnote plate seventy five in volume five of wilkinson's ancient egypt will give the student an idea of how to set to work i repeat it cannot yet be judged what results might be obtained by a nobly practised conventionalism of this kind but however that may be the first fact the necessity of animal and figure drawing is absolutely certain and no person who shrinks from it will ever become a great designer one great good arises even from the first step in figure drawing that it gets the student quit at once of the notion of formal symmetry if you learn only to draw a leaf well you are taught in some of your schools to turn it the other way opposite to itself 
and the two leaves set opposite ways are called a design, and thus it is supposed possible to produce ornamentation, though you have no more brains than a looking-glass or a kaleidoscope has. But if you once learn to draw the human figure, you will find that knocking two men's heads together does not necessarily constitute a good design, nay, that it makes a very bad design or no design at all, and you will see at once that to arrange a group of two or more figures you must, though perhaps it may be desirable to balance or oppose them, at the same time vary their attitudes and make one not the reverse of the other but the companion of the other. I had a somewhat amusing discussion on this subject with a friend only the other day, and one of his retorts upon me was so neatly put and expresses so completely all that can either be said or shown on the opposite side that it is well worth giving it to you exactly in the form it was sent to me my friend had been maintaining that the essence of ornament consisted in three things contrast series and symmetry i replied by letter that none of them nor all of them together will produce ornament here making a ragged blot with the back of my pen on the paper, you have contrast, but it isn't ornament. Here, one, two, three, four, five, six, writing the numerals, you have series, but it is an ornament. And here, sketching a rough but symmetrical stick-figure sketch of a human body at the side, you have symmetry, but it isn't ornament. My friend replied, Your materials were not ornament because you did not apply them. I send them to you back, made up into a choice sporting neckerchief. Illustration. Sketch of a square of cloth decorated with a diagonal grid pattern of stick-figure human forms, with repeated and reflected ink-blot shapes at the corners, and the digits one through six, arranged into simple symmetrical shapes, and repeated around the border. Symmetrical figure. Unit of diaper. Contrast. Corner ornaments. Series. Border ornaments. Each figure is converted into a harmony by being revolved on its two axes, the whole opposed in contrasting series. My answer was, or rather was to the effect, for I must expand it a little here, that his words, because you did not apply them, contained the gist of the whole matter, that the application of them, or any other things, was precisely the essence of design. The non-application, or wrong application, the negation of design, that his use of the poor materials was in this case admirable, and that if he could explain to me in clear words the principles on which he had so used them, he would be doing a very great service to all students of art. Tell me, therefore, I asked, these main points. 1. How did you determine the number of figures you would put into the neckerchief? Had there been more, it would have been mean and ineffective, a pepper-and-salt sprinkling of figures, had there been fewer, it would have been monstrous. How did you fix the number? 2. How did you determine the breadth of the border and relative size of the numerals? 3. Why are there two lines outside of the border and one only inside? Why are there no more lines? Why not 3 and 2 or 3 and 5? Why lines at all to separate the barbarous figures? And why, if lines at all, not double or treble instead of single. 4. Why did you put the double blots at the corners? Why not at the angles of the checkers, or in the middle of the border? It is precisely your knowing why not to do these things, and why to do just what you have done, which constituted your power of design. And like all the people I have ever known who had that power, you are entirely unconscious of the essential laws by which you work, and confuse other people by telling them that the design depends on symmetry and series, when in fact it depends entirely on your own sense and judgment. End of section 6. Recording by Todd Albrecht.